Ok, 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 ok. Back to the front. 1916 is the year of the great battles. You can think of the Somme, of course, Basile of Offensive, Isonso River, and of course, for me as a French guy, Verdun. All these battles will be unprecedented in terms of size, of number of deaths, of equipment, of duration. Only Verdun is like 300 days. All these battles are also interconnected and the result of one battle directly influences the other. And all of this will be indecisive. 1916 is a year of carnage and of lost opportunities. World War I was supposed to have been a short and glorious war. But by 1916, a new kind of industrialized warfare had seen the death toll soar into the millions, with no end in sight. And at that point, yes, it was clear to everyone that this business was going to last a long time. And by 1915, all the societies had restructured in order to cope to this new situation. Industrialists reorganized to create large consortiums and have the means to supply the front. In 1915, all armies had to be re-equipped. Uh, new weapons had to be reintroduced in order to match the needs of the trench warfare. Grenades, trench mortars, flamethrowers, rifles adapt to trench conditions, combat gases, etc. Motorization had to be increased in order to supply the front. Aviation was strengthened to improve the reconnaissance. Artillery was transformed and you had to produce astronomical quantities of shells and ammunition. Naval blockades were beginning to cause shortages of food and fuel across Europe. While thousands of women had entered the workforce, replacing the men sent to fight in their millions. And now you have also societies without men, where those who remain and are able to go to the front are cowards. For example, in England, if you were old enough to join the fight and you were not at the front, then you were awarded the Order of the White Feather. Uh, to show your cowardice. All sides were preparing for a long war. The war has raged for a year and a half as the Allies continue to battle the Central Powers, recently joined by Bulgaria. At sea, the British maintain their naval blockade of Germany, preventing the import of food and other vital raw materials. Germany has retaliated with a U-boat blockade of Britain, but has to limit its attacks to avoid provoking the neutral USA, whose citizens have already been caught in the crossfire. I also believe that the geopolitical game we are witnessing here on a global level is unprecedented, with impossible equations to solve. To avoid starving, you have to break the blockade. You have to destroy ships. But these ships belong to a power on the other side of the globe, and you don't want to upset this power. We often talk about mistakes that were made during World War I, but we should also talk about the complexity of the situation people had to deal with. On the Western Front, French, British and Belgian troops are dug in opposite the Germans, both sides trapped in the bloody stalemate of trench warfare. On the Eastern Front, the Russians have ended their long retreat and stabilised the line, but their army has suffered huge losses. On the Italian Front, Italian troops have launched a series of costly, unsuccessful attacks against strong Austro-Hungarian defences. While on the Balkan front, the Central Powers have overrun Serbia 
whose army is forced to make a bitter retreat through the Albanian mountains. Now, on the 5th of January, Austro-Hungarian troops attack Montenegro. They are delayed at the Battle of Mojkovac, but three weeks later, Montenegro is forced to surrender. On the Caucasus front, the Russians launch a surprise winter offensive against Ottoman Turkish forces. Six weeks later, Russian troops occupy the city of Erzurum. In April, they capture the Black Sea port of Trebizond. Meanwhile, the British transport two motorboats to Lake Tanganyika in Africa. They finally arrive after a 10,000 mile trip by sea and land and help the British seize control of the strategic lake from local German forces. The and it just reminded me of the surrealistic adventure of the Russian fleet in 1905 during the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, the, the Baltic fleet was sent to the oversight of the globe using basically the same route uh, that the one we saw, but this time uh, going further east to Vladivostok. During this trip, the Russian fleet almost starting several wars because they, for example, fired on <laughs> merchant ships in the middle of Atlantic. And this trip took them several months. Uh, the, and at the end of the day, they were wiped out in a few minutes at the Battle of Tsushima by the Japanese fleet. Same month, in German Cameroon, German troops besieged on Mora Mountain for 18 months finally surrender to the Allies. It marks the end of the Cameroon campaign. On the Western Front, the Germans unleash a devastating assault on the French fortress town of Verdun. German General Erich von Falkenhayn knows France will defend this symbolic town to the last man. His plan, in his own words, is to bleed France white in its defense. Bleeding France white. 1915 was the bloodiest year of the war for the French army as they had to hold the Western Front while the British Army was building itself. There were also some very deadly offensives, notably in Champagne. And the German Army sees here an opportunity to knock out the French Army. While Verdun, Verdun is a salient in the front line, which means it's kind of a bulge that sticks out of the front and can be attacked from all sides. It's an important logistical hub, and if it falls, it is going to destabilize the whole front. It's also a symbolic city, and it would be a disaster in terms of public image if it's captured. During the first two days of the offensive, two million German shells will fall on the French lines. One heavy shells every three seconds, and one heavy shells per meter square. Hence. It is the strategy of attrition. Verdun becomes one of the most terrifying battles of the war. A mincing machine, where infantry divisions are destroyed almost as fast as they can be fed into the line. In Britain, one million men have already volunteered for military service. But the government realises it won't be enough. Britain becomes the last major power to introduce conscription. The organization will be very special with the PAL battalions, where they will group young people from the same village or the same neighborhood together to increase morale and cohesion within the units. And it's going to be terrible precisely for the same reason, because each dead comrade is maybe your brother or a childhood friend and it's going to be devastating on the morale of these young soldiers. That spring on the Western Front, British troops are the last to be issued with steel helmets. 
The nature of trench warfare produces a high proportion of head wounds. The German Stahlhelm, the French Adrian helmet, and the British Mark I steel helmet offer limited protection from shell splinters and shrapnel. And so, with the trenches, it's your head that sticks out, and she's the one who will take the damage first. These helmets will be designed to resist shock, shrapnel, and shell blasts. On the other hand, it will never stop a bullet. Uh, we have to forget the scene, you know, in the private Ryan, where one guy takes a bullet on the helmet, which ricochets, and then he removes it like, wow, what just happened? And he takes a second bullet. No, it cannot happen. Neutral Portugal has been cooperating with the British, which seems to offer the best chance of holding on to her African colony, Portuguese Angola. On the 9th of March, Germany retaliates by declaring war on Portugal. On the Eastern Front, Russia launches an attack near Lake Narok to relieve pressure on the French at Verdun, but it's a disaster. There are 100,000 Russian casualties, and the attack fails to divert any German troops from the fighting at Verdun. In Dublin, Irish Republicans launch an armed revolt against British rule. It becomes known as the Easter Rising, and is put down after six days of street fighting. See, this postcard is German. Der Aufstand der Schindfeiner in Ireland means the rebellion of the Sinn Féin in Ireland. Sinn Féin means, I guess, the path of the freedom, uh, and it's the organization behind this rebellion. It's like the nowadays IRA. And I guess that the Germans tried to support this insurrection, of course, and they tried to send them weapons. These were intercepted by the Royal Navy, I guess. In the Middle East, after a five-month siege, British forces at Kut surrender. General Townsend leads 9,000 British and Indian soldiers into captivity. About half later die from starvation or disease. Britain wants Arab support in its fight against the Ottoman Empire, so it's promised Arab leaders an independent Arab state after the war. But now, Britain and France secretly sign the Sykes-Picot Agreement, planning after the war to divide the Middle East into British and French zones of control. Un um, these agreements will rightly be experienced as a betrayal, and by creating these artificial borders, these agreements will also create destabilization, whose effects are, are still very much perceptible today. And the, the symbol of this Arab's revolt is um, Lawrence of Arabia, who's a British captain and who was sent there in order to convince the different Arab movements to collaborate and try to organize cooperation between the different actions. He will take part of an incredible guerrilla war against the Ottoman Empire, notably harassing the railway lines on camels or on horseback. Aware of this deal, Hussein bin Ali, Sharif of Mecca, leads the Arabs in revolt against Turkish Ottoman rule. In the Battle of Mecca, his forces seize control of the holy city. On the Italian front, Austro-Hungarian forces launch a surprise attack at Asiago. Italian defenses give way. Austro-Hungarian troops are poised to break through into northern Italy. That month in the North Sea, the German High Seas Fleet clashes with the British Grand Fleet at the Battle of Jutland. In the only major naval battle of the war, the British suffer heavier losses, but claim victory as the German fleet withdraws and does not re-emerge from its base for the rest of the war. And 
considering that some of the tensions leading to the war were created by the naval arms race between the UK and Germany, it's a bit anticlimactic. <laughs> For the summer of 1916, the Allies have planned major, simultaneous offensives against the Central Powers, from East and West. Now they are needed more than ever to relieve pressure on the French at Verdun and the Italians at Asiago. The Russians launch their attack first. On the Eastern Front, General Alexei Brusilov has carefully maintained the element of surprise. His troops break through the enemy lines, in some places advancing 60 miles and taking 200,000 prisoners. Why does it work? We can mention a couple of stuff. First, excellent preparation of the offensive. Second, very good training of the troops. Creation of specialized units and a very good artillery infantry cooperation. And these are based on the acquired knowledge of the first two years of the war. In addition of these, we can mention that in order to sustain the battle of Asiago, Austria-Hungary thought that it would be a good idea to take some very experienced troops from the Eastern Front and to send them to Italy. We can say that the overall effect of the Brusilov Offensive is that it's kind of the death of the Austria-Hungarian army. And why does it stop? Due to the lack of resources and especially logistic problems. This brilliant, though costly, Russian attack achieves its aim, as the Central Powers are forced to redeploy troops from other fronts to shore up the line. At sea, British cruiser HMS Hampshire en route to Russia, hits a mine and sinks off Orkney. Among the 650 dead is Britain's iconic Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener. Three days later in the Adriatic, Italian troop ship Principe Umberto is sunk by a German submarine. It's the deadliest sinking of the war, with 1,900 lives lost. On the Western Front, Britain and France launch their major summer offensive, the Battle of the Somme. Hopes are high for a breakthrough, but the first day is a disaster. A long Allied artillery bombardment fails to knock out German defences, and waves of British infantry are cut down by machine gun fire as they advance into no man's land. In the space of a few hours, the British suffer 57,000 casualties, a third of them killed. It's the worst day in the history of the British Army. I think we'll cover the sum in the next episode, but in a few words. The artillery preparation produces very poor results, with numerous shell failures. It's even, in a way, counterproductive because the Germans suspect that something is going to happen after this intense artillery preparation. Then, when the English soldiers come out of their trenches very heavily equipped, because they were told that they were going to face no resistance, so they can only walk very slowly, well, these guys get chopped by the German machine guns. But more attacks are ordered, and the battle will rage for another five months. Encouraged by the Russian advance, Romania joins the Allies. But despite an initially successful advance into Transylvania, Romania quickly faces a counter-offensive from German, Bulgarian and Austro-Hungarian forces. The Allied force at Salonika tries to support Romania by launching their own offensive towards Monastir. With Serbian troops in the lead, there are small gains, but dogged Bulgarian resistance prevents a breakthrough. 
On the Western Front, General von Falkenhayn finally calls off the attack at Verdun. The French army has honoured their commander, General Nivelle's promise. Ils ne passeront pas. They shall not pass. But victory comes at a terrible price. 365,000 casualties. The Germans lose almost as many. Verdun remains one of the bloodiest battles in human history. My girlfriend comes from Verdun. When I go there, I notice two things. The first one is that there are cemeteries everywhere. Really, I mean everywhere, and huge one. The second thing I noticed is that the nature has been completely altered and distorted by artillery, with shell craters everywhere around the city. When you arrive from Paris by train, the station is not in Verdun. You have to drive 30 minutes by car to reach the city. And the road that leads to the city is called the Sacred Path. It was the lifeline of Verdun. If you look at photos on Google, you will see immense lines of trucks which supply the front, allowing the rotation of troops, the evacuation of the wounded, etc. It's a victory that was made possible by logistics and by the courage of the defenders on certain parts of the front. Men were some, sometimes cut off from their units and locked up, for example, in the forts of Douaumont and the fort of the Vaux. And to, sur to survive, they had to drink their own urine. Also, on the picture of this battle, you always see French soldiers with cigarettes or pipes. It's not that they were particularly heavy smokers, it's to disguise the smell of the blood and of the corpses. It is said that they could smell the rot of the dead people 15 kilometers away from Verdun. For his defeat at Verdun, Falkenhayn is sacked and Germany's heroes of the Eastern Front, von Hindenburg and Ludendorff, take command in the West. Meanwhile, the Battle of the Somme continues. Near the village of Flair, the British introduce a new weapon they hope can break the deadlock of the trenches. It is called the tank. But despite some small successes, the first tanks are too few in number and too prone to mechanical failure to make any real impact and they are very slow too. And overall, we still don't know how to use this new weapon. A weapon, in order to be effective, needs to be part of a system. How do you make them work with artillery, with infantry, with cavalry? And what is it in the first place? Is it mobile artillery? Is it infantry? Is it cavalry? So we allied will have to learn from these mistakes and these failures, but they will do so and that will be a great part of the victory. On the Eastern Front, Russia's Brusilov offensive comes to an end. Casualty estimates vary wildly, but it's clear both sides have suffered catastrophic losses. Neither the Russian nor the Austro-Hungarian army ever fully recovers. On the Italian Front, heavy fighting rages throughout the autumn as Italian forces make repeated, costly assaults against Austro-Hungarian positions along the Isonzo River. So we are in the ninth battle of the Isonzo River. So Italian chief of staff Cadorna will butcher his own army. He attributes these defeats, or at least the fact that Italian cannot manage to break through uh, he puts all of this on moral failure and not the lack of preparation or material or even an incompetent leadership. So he reintroduces punishments such as the decimation. It's a punishment dated from the Roman legend from antiquity. And so you take a unit that has failed and you shoot one of every ten men to give an example. 
Morum. The Battle of the Somme comes to an end amid autumn rain and mud. The Allies have advanced 10 miles at the cost of 600,000 casualties. German losses are about 450,000. The Allies reassure themselves that this is a winning strategy, because at this rate, Germany will run out of men first. See the shift in the logics of the commanders. Till then, we were used to reasons in terms of decisive battle, breakthrough, encirclement, and now it's like we're just trying to inflict death by 1,000 wounds. Meanwhile, disaster engulfs Romania as the country is overrun by the Central Powers. Romanian forces suffer a quarter of a million casualties. The remnants of its army take position alongside the Russians on the Eastern Front. That winter, Franz Joseph, Emperor of Austria since 1848, dies. He is succeeded by his son, Karl. Uh, not his son, but it's grandnephew, I guess. In Britain, Prime Minister Herbert Asquith is forced from office and succeeded by David Lloyd George. While General Joffre is replaced as French Commander-in-Chief by General Nivelle, who promises... Good riddance for Joffre. Honestly, this guy blundered big time in 1916. We had the opportunity to sway Bulgaria into joining the Allies. It was blocked by Joffre. There was an opportunity at the Battle of the Somme to achieve something uh, and some kind of breakthrough. And it was blocked by General Joffre. This guy was good riddance. Victory through bold, aggressive action. Amid the comings and goings, US President Woodrow Wilson's attempts to mediate a peace settlement come to nothing. Neither side is willing to make concessions. Ok, ok, ok. Terrible, terrible year. And the next one is going to be even worse. In the meantime, I think I'll see you again for the special episode on the Somme. And till then, I wish you a good day. Bye-bye, guys.